Alright guys, today is all about a different way to build characters. It's using the colors of magic to do all the heavy lifting and hard parts for you, and this video in particular is looking at the color blue. If you want a general overview of the whole system, you might want to have a look at our white episode first, but I'm just going to dive right in right now. Blue is the color of seeking perfection through knowledge. It's the color of learning, of control, of being the best version of yourself you can be. Blue believes in the tabula rasa, the blank slate. According to Blue, you are the raw material with which you can sculpt the person you would like to be. When you exercise just to make yourself a better person, you're leaning into your Blue. When you take an online course or spend eight continuous hours listening to non-fiction audiobooks on the history of Italian cheesemaking, you're leaning into Blue perhaps a little too much. Blue thinks emotions shouldn't really have a place in decision making. It likes the careful plan over the rash impulse, it never wants to act without considering and other things that can act in unpredictable ways, Blue hates. It wants to exert control over them, to have them fall in line, and it also hates essentialist thinking. Arguments like, it's always been this way, or this is how things are supposed to be, inflame Blue. Blue doesn't think you should find your place in the world, it thinks you should carve out that place for yourself. Blue-focused heroes are great fun to play in D&D or other RPGs, Usually the person running the game is going to have fun with them too, because a character who is motivated to learn more about the world around them is exactly what the person who was running your game, the person who has spent hours and hours crafting that world, wants you to do. Blue characters can be excellent listeners, taking notes on the events around them, really absorbing what's spoken when people talk to them. They tend to lean into intelligence, but not always, not necessarily. You can count on a blue character to have some trick or two up their sleeve when the going gets rough. However, blue can be cold and unfeeling. Blue characters might hyper-focus on goals to the detriment of personal relationships. When making the choice between saving a library or saving an orphanage, it might be a better time to be a book than an orphan. Blue characters can be overwhelmed by strange new situations over which they have little control, and might not be the best improvisers. They can also look down on others for lacking their sophisticated facts-based approach to the world. A good way to really zero in what a color is like is to examine its relationship with its enemies. In this case, that's red and green. Green thinks that happiness comes from accepting your place in the world, from being what you essentially are, and Blue thinks the exact opposite, that happiness comes from reshaping the world to suit you and yourself. Blue is also the color of privileging logic and thinking over emotions, whereas Red thinks that planning and thinking get in the way of expressing yourself and in the way of living in the moment. A great example of, of a hero who values knowledge and learning is Bruce Banner, as in the Hulk on his non-green days. The thing he essentially is at his core is a horrible green monster, and he has to constantly fight to make sure that he is the thing he wants to be, not the thing that he essentially is. It's also his feelings, his emotions, that trigger the change, and so Banner is forced to research and use meditative techniques to make sure he's always thinking first, feeling second. Not all blue heroes are so extremely defined by the things they're not, but these principles, I think, in general do apply. Take a peasant who aspires to be a knight. A green character might tell them, no, appreciate the place in the world you have, give up with this foolish dream, but a blue hero is likely to support their efforts to become something greater than they are. When the crowd is baying for the blood of a murderer, a red character could get swept up in the fervor and the catharsis. It'll be the blue character, probably, who stands as the voice of reason, pointing out flaws in the evidence, looking for truth, even inconvenient truth, wherever it might lead. Of course, most characters aren't a singular color, they're a combination of colors. So we'll go over the four pairs that Blue can lean into now. White is the color of peace through structure, of selflessly acting for the good of the community. A blue-white character is likely to be a student of systems, laws, and the like. They're likely to absolutely loathe those who act impulsively without care for how those actions affect others. They're great at understanding systems and very inquisitive, but they don't enjoy learning for the fun of it necessarily. Usually they want a fuller understanding of the things they study and that's their primary motivation. They can be motivated to help others in their community, to use learning and systems as a tool to benefit the lives of everyone. We often think of democracy as this kind of red idea, but really creating systems that benefit everyone is an archetypal blue-white thing to do. You can still have blue-white monarchists, people who think that the preservation of the current structure is best for everyone, but thinking about structures of governance in general is quite a blue-white thing to do. And I'd say that Sherlock Holmes is a good example of a blue-white hero. He's primarily motivated by a desire to work his brain, to challenge himself, to become the best version of himself that he can be. He likes solving puzzles, and that's his big thing. But you'll notice he puts his powers of deduction to use for the public good. He doesn't create the world's most devious criminal empire. He puts those empires to bed. Blue and white, in perfect harmony. Of course, 
Blue can have a dark side. Black is the color of satisfaction through opportunity. So when Blue leans into Black, you get the embodiment of ruthlessness, a hero who is willing to do anything and everything to get what needs to be done, done. Warlocks can often lean in this direction, as a character becomes so hungry for knowledge, they'll sign away their soul in order to get it. These ruthless types still make for good heroes. Often, they might find they enjoy the company of their fellow party members, or maybe they enjoy the challenge of fighting great foes. They enjoy the rewards that that brings, both monetary and societal. If you want to flex your power and become better by tackling greater enemies, it's smarter to do it in a way that the local government will reward rather than punish. A blue-black character despises green's essentialist thinking. Blue-black characters really do make themselves into whatever they want to become, and are always eager to surpass their limits. When Green says, slow down, you'll be happier if you just give in to your inner nature instead of fighting it, Blue Black scoffs. I think a good example of this kind of hero is Batman, a person whose greatest asset is intelligence and whose second greatest asset is his dedication, that is, if you ignore the amount of actual assets he's inherited. Batman is almost perfect Blue Black. He stalks in the shadows using fear and surprise as his primary weapon to dissuade criminals, and ruthlessly cuts down people who are breaking the law. He doesn't work primarily within the law, he is breaking it every time he exacts his form of justice. His big difference from Sherlock Holmes is the motivation. Batman was traumatized by the murder of his parents in a mugging, and now he copes with that trauma by trying to exert control on the chaotic world of Gotham City. Notice that he spends comparatively less of his energy on social programs that would address the underlying root causes of the crime that killed his parents. Instead, Batman seeks satisfaction by directly exercising control over the crime with his own two fists. You might look at his golden rule, to never use guns, and see that there might be something white in that, but I think in reality, blue and black are the colors of self-determination. Batman doesn't refrain from using guns because he thinks guns are dangerous or wrong. He refrains from using guns because he wants to sculpt himself to be a different kind of person than the one who killed his parents. The desire to control oneself above all else is quintessential blue-black. But now we're heading into the colors that have some big disagreements. Red wants to live its life impulsively, without restraint, to attain freedom through action, and Blue prefers careful planning and cold, calculating logic. Mark Rosewater has made the argument that this is where creativity lives, and the harmony between one's emotional side and one's logical side. We often see bards exist in this space, marrying a quick mind with a loud heart. I think a lot of characters actually are in this space, but unfortunately I think a lot of them aren't exactly there for good reasons. There is a tendency to create characters that are intellectual when it suits us, and chaotic when it doesn't. These characters aren't so much finding a harmony between the heart and mind as they are flitting violently between them. And that's fine, especially if you're new, but we can aim for a character whose parts are a little bit more cohesively connected than that. A character who uses their thinking brain to decide what to do, and their emotions to motivate the action. Think Jojo Bizarre Adventures' Panacotta Fugo. A perfectly blue character is unlikely to be leaning on emotions the way Panacotta does, but Fugo and your blue-red character might realize the utility in being motivated, being driven by emotions. Interestingly, you could get a very cool barbarian out of this idea, someone who decisively deliberates on when to engage the rage, so to speak. I mean, really, when you have enemy colors like this, colors that disagree more than they agree, there's a lot of immediately apparent directions for your character to go. Do they use their own emotions, governed by logic, or do they plan emotionally and impulsively? Improvisation is definitely in this realm, but so is someone whose depth of knowledge on human emotions is such that it allows them to make plans that account well for the impulses of others. Really, the spectrum of blue-red is wide, and so it's even more of a shame that a lot of characters end up here out of a lack of thought. But before I can moralize too much, we'll start talking about blue-green. Green is the color of wisdom through acceptance, of finding your place in a wider community. This is the polar opposite of blue. Blue makes itself in whatever image it likes. An example of this conflict in microcosm is technology. Blue creates tools to make the world around it easier to deal with. Green tries to ensure that it fits within the natural world as much as possible. This is one of the more esoteric groupings in the color pair. What does it mean for your characters to marry loving and hating technology? Again, there's a bunch of different interpretations one could go for. Maybe someone who is selective and when they value technology over nature. Wooden shields are okay, iron shields are not. This is where most druids end up by default. Or what about someone who adopts a mix of adapting themselves to the environment and adapting the environment to them, trying to twist nature and civilization together in ways that benefit both. Elven cities can often be like this. You can imagine the forest provides for the elves as the elves provide for the forest. 
One of the most interesting things about this color identity, however, is the contextual nature of what natural or artificial really mean. Take Hiccup from How to Train Your Dragon. When caught between two different paradigms of what natural meant, one being the toxic culture he hailed from, bent on conquer and xenophobia, and the other being a harmony with the local misunderstood dragons, Hiccup uses technology, saddles, taming techniques, harnesses, prosthetic limbs, in order to better incorporate with nature and live in harmony with the natural forces around him. I believe Hiccup offers a great example as to how a blue-green character can be played. One of the players in the first long-term campaign I ever DM'd had heavy shades of blue-green, wanting to learn more about the Fae in the Feywild so that he could better incorporate himself into that world that he so loved. But these videos aren't just about giving broad archetypes for your characters to play in, they're about using the color system to develop those characters too. A great way to do this is to make a two-color character and then explore the other three colors from that perspective. So, let's make an example. We're gonna have a wizard call her Rhodes. Rhodes is blue, leaning into white. She loves learning, learning about anything, but especially magic. She loves the rules, the order, dotting her I's and crossing her T's. Her chosen field is abjuration, the study of magic itself, how it works, how to manipulate it, and how to stop it in its tracks. Rhodes can't help but grin like a fool whenever she successfully counters a spell. It's the sublimest expression of supremacy over her craft. Funding her research isn't easy, and sometimes she's forced to join a band of mercenaries to kill some monster or clear out some ruined keep. She enjoys helping the community and has a love of history, so she enjoys exploring these ruins and finding out what life there used to be like, but her library always calls her back. She prepares well and is rarely surprised, but handles it poorly when the event does arise. Oh, that rhyme. Her ability to think under pressure gets compromised by stress, and sometimes she envies the sorcerers in her mercenary group, and how they can use Arcana to solve problems as easily as breathing. So far, so normal. But what directions is Rhodes likely to go? If her mind becomes sharper and her heart colder, if she finds few friends and fewer reasons to venture outside her library, she could lose interest in society or community altogether, aside from what advantages she can glean from them. As she slips more and more into a black way of viewing the world, she becomes more and more mercenary and mercurial, is likely to extort a noble as she is to work honestly for a monetary reward. The fewer barriers between her and her studies, her and her experiments, after all, the better. Although the exact opposite could happen. Maybe she becomes infatuated instead with a particularly interesting series of ruins, and she falls into the rabbit hole of history, cataloging ancient societies, and structuring theories as to the current world's place in a grand chain of events. Eager to share her theories and learn from the theories of others, she seeks out other historians and historical conventions, leading into green as she finds a wider group of people interested in the way things used to be and becomes a part of it. Maybe the political situation around Rhodes changes dramatically for the worse, far an invasion with the appearance of a new, supernatural threat. Forced to adapt and survive, Rhodes embraces red and becomes impulsive, forging her magical strength not in the confines of her library but in the fires of the front lines. She dedicates herself to passionately defending her local community, making friends and finding a real purpose in her new surroundings. Those are all just suggestions. There's again an infinite variety of ways things can go. Maybe you have different ideas for what Rhodes would look like with all these different colors. And that's fine, it's good. The framework here isn't about results, it's about process. Getting you to consider your character's possible futures in a way you wouldn't have otherwise. So you can decide naturally what makes sense in the narrative. Alright, we're almost done now folks. Lastly, we'll look at a specific situation in detail and wonder how the different flavors of blue characters might deal with it. So. Party stumbles across a small village on a miserable day. The ground is slick and wet with mud, and a cloying, heavy sense of wet dread that permeates the skin and seeps into their bones hangs in the air. They arrive to find the townsfolk gathered in the center of a village square, trying and failing to light a stake alight. Frightened, shivering, bound and gagged is a young boy. The townsfolk view the party with some suspicion, but after some prying, they let them know what's happened here. This young boy is a sorcerer, a dangerous one, who, in a fit of rage, accidentally burned his family home to the ground. His mother barely survived, dragging out his youngest sister, but his father and his two brothers are dead. The crime is terrible, the event tragic, and only one punishment seems appropriate. Death by burning. How is your blue character to feel about such a thing? If they're blue-white, they might have to agree with the townsfolk, or at least abide by their customs. The law is the law, and the rules are the rules, no matter how unfortunate or unfair any specific application of those rules might seem. A blue-green character might be horrified. The boy can't control the way he was born. His magical power is a part of him, and even if it got out of hand, he shouldn't be punished. 
he should be given the opportunity to learn and to grow his power, to control it, to become the thing he was always meant to be. A blue-red character might understand the people of this town have suffered a tragedy and are acting out of both emotions and logic. A righteous anger and a desire for petty vengeance, mixed with the knowledge that such crimes cannot be tolerated and must be discouraged by any means necessary, even means as violent as these. A blue-black character might not really care for the morality of the situation. Perhaps they feel sympathy for the boy, prevented from achieving his true potential, or maybe they just realize that if freed, the boy would owe them a great debt and would be a powerful asset. Or maybe, again, almost anything else. If you disagree on what these different colored characters would think about this situation, that's actually great. It means you're developing your own highly sophisticated sense of what does and doesn't make sense in this framework. Again, it's not the results we're looking for, it's the process and it's the perspective. If you like this video, you can of course subscribe for more. If you want to hang out with like-minded folk on our Discord, it's linked in the description. If you're watching this far into the video, <laughs> thanks, uh, that's awesome. I love that there are people out there willing to listen to the things I have to say. It's a good feeling, I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Safe home.